much. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. We have a very exciting evening uh, coming up, uh, which is the launch of the Old Rise uh, Judicial Memoir uh, from the former Deputy uh, Chief Justice Dikang Moseneke. Uh, my name is Biniam Dawit Mazmur. Uh, I am the Deputy Dean for Postgraduate and Research at the Faculty of Law, University of the Western Cape. Uh, I have the singular honor of uh, being the moderator for uh, this evening's uh, conversation. Now, let me just put a few ground rules uh, at the outset. Uh, the first is that this session is being recorded for the purpose of record. Uh, so that's the inf instruction that I've received from the controllers, uh, as was already uh, mentioned earlier. So I thought I would mention that to you. Uh, there is also uh, another point that I need to mention at the outset, which is the fact that there is a hashtag uh, for this event, uh, and the hashtag is All Rise UWC. All Rise UWC. Hashtag All Rise UWC. Uh, that's the hashtag for the event. This is not intended to, uh, to initiate any revolution at UWC. Uh, the intention is just simply to reflect that there are a number of uh, events, very important, very interesting events for the launch of this book that have been held at different institutions. So we try to differentiate this by saying all rise and then also the UWC element is there. All rise UWC, that's the hashtag. Now the other point uh, as a ground rule that I need to mention is that we will have the conversation going shortly, but participants are encouraged to put their questions in the chat. So questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, obviously, the priority will be to the colleagues that are on the panel for the conversation uh, for this event. Uh, but inevitably, we will have time to actually come to some of uh, the questions that are being raised so that it becomes uh, a dialogue. So those are just some of the basic rules that I thought I would put uh, at the outset uh, for the event. <clears throat> in terms of the sequence of things, what I plan to do is uh, of course, I'm going to introduce uh, our speaker. Many of them hardly need any introduction, but I'll do my level based. Uh, and after that, I will give the floor to the former Deputy Chief Justice, Moseneke. Uh, he will take a few minutes to reflect on uh, some of the elements of the book, uh, the importance of the book, and any points that you would like to raise, any team, if you prefer, from the book that you'd like to raise to draw our attention to, you can, you can do that. After that, I'll give the opportunity to uh, Judge Vincent uh, Saldana, uh, and then that will be followed by uh, my two colleagues uh, from the Faculty of Law, uh, Lisa Draga and Tabile Chonko. Now, let me mention one thing. I have had the opportunity to look at a number of the events uh, that uh, were uh, organized to, to, to do the launch of this very important and very timely and interesting book. Ours is being pitched as an intergenerational dialogue. So we were very deliberate and conscious in terms of who, bring, who we bring to this panel, some of the issues that we would like to raise and the conversation that we actually would like to uh, take forward in this uh, lounge. Uh, I know the former Deputy Chief Justice Moseneke, I've heard you in, an, in a couple of occasions where you have, pre, you have said you would have preferred to have the conversation with the new generation, uh, instead of those of us who are the academicians who are very much well said in terms of our uh, surroundings and comfortable in terms of our space and some of reflections are already in, the, in books and articles and whatever we've written in. Your wish is our command. So what we're promising to provide, not just only to you, but also to the participants is an intergenerational dialogue and I'm happy to be presiding over that. Now, in moving forward, in terms of the introductions, I will say a few words to introduce the former Deputy Chief Justice uh, Mosaneke. I would be I would be almost irrelevant if I were to draw your attention to the fact that he's a legal scholar of note. Uh, he's a giant in the field, not just only here in South Africa, beyond the borders of South Africa. He is a pan-Africanist at heart. And not just only because he says so but also because he does so. And that's absolutely critical to keep at the back of our mind for the conversation today. He has a very illustrious career that has spanned decades. Uh, you've, been, you've been in practice, uh, you've been in politics, 
Uh, you were a very young at heart, uh, especially if I can mention that when you, when you joined politics. Uh, you were in business very briefly. Uh, and of course, you have a very illustrious career uh, as, uh, as someone who served on the bench, not just only on the bench, but at the highest uh, level of the bench here in South Africa. I should also mention that you have received the Order of Lutuli in gold in 2018, which is a very befitting recognition of the work and contribution that you have done, not just only for this country, but also the continent and beyond. But I want to spend one minute talking about the very intimate relationship that we have with you as UWC. Justice Moseneke presented the first Dean's Distinguished Lecture at UWC in 2015. That was the first time that I had the opportunity to meet you face to face. You were very generous and you, the intellect and the input that you provided through that lecture still resonates, not just only with me, but a number of colleagues and students that were in that audience. You were appointed as extraordinary professor in the public law and jurisprudence department at the faculty. And we continue to appreciate the input that you provide within that framework as well. In 2018, the former deputy chief justice donated to the law faculty at UWC the fees he had received from chairing the arbitration hearings into the life to see the many tragedy that had involved the deaths of 144 mentally ill patients. Justice Moseneke contributed a further additional funding during the course of the year, and UWC added a bit of a, a matching fund to that. And the interest on the capital sum continues to be used to promote excellence within the law faculty. And as Deputy Dean, I can confirm that we are actually putting to very good use, particularly for young, particularly black South African scholars to push the boundaries in the field of law. And we're absolutely grateful for that support. I have also heard you say that this event is not really about promoting book sales. And you have mentioned that this is actually about getting the circle bigger. It's actually getting more people to get access to the book. And within that framework, you have also donated uh, 30 copies of the book uh, to the faculty. I have received my free copy. I had the pleasure of reading it. I can promise you that because I'm employed, I can afford to buy my own. I plan to hand over this book to a junior colleague or, a, or, or someone from, from the postgraduate program that can actually benefit from it. I leave it at that for now at this point. And let me quickly introduce Justice Vincent Saldana. Judge Saldana practiced as an attorney since 1985, was the regional and national director of the Legal Resource Center, also served as president of NADL and the chairperson of the South Africa Development Committee Lawyers Association and co-chairperson of the Law Society of South Africa and has served on the DOI, the, the Della Omar Institute, for many years. Presently, he also serves on other boards, the Albisax Trust for Constitutionalism and the Rule of Law and the Center for Justice and Crime Prevention. And of course, judge of the Cape High Court since 2008. And as the Della Omar Institute, as UWC, uh, we continue to benefit from his guidance in more ways than one. And it's a pleasure to have you uh, on this panel. The next speaker that I'm going to introduce is my good colleague, Lisa Draga. She's an associate lecturer in the Department of Public Law and Jurisprudence uh, at UWC since February 2018. And she teaches constitutional law at the second year level and South African Bill of Rights as a fourth year elective. She's also a very proud graduate of UWC and obtained her LLB summa cum laude in 2006. She's a first recipient of UWC's Ivan Rujemas scholarship. And that's one of our late colleagues uh, who passed away in 2014 and was awarded LLM from the University of Columbia, Missouri in 2007. From July 2010 to December 2011, uh, she worked as a legal researcher for none other than Justice Yacoub at the Constitutional Court of South Africa. And her experience at the court has enriched the manner in which she studies, analyze, and teach court judgments and the law. She served as a social justice lawyer for six years at the Equal Education Law Center. And she has very critical and important skill sets, particularly pertaining to the right to free and compulsory primary education or basic education, or generally in education law. She's currently studying towards a PhD in education law at UWC. And she says, I'm new to academia, and I hope she hopes to establish herself as a prominent uh, academic. And it's an absolute pleasure to have her on this panel. Last but not least is Tabile Chonko, born and raised in Pretoria Glen in Soweto, Protea Glen in Soweto, graduated with an LLB from University of Witz Waterstrand in 2015, after which she completed her LLM in law, state and multi-level government at Della Oman Institute, which was then called the Community Law Center. 
Having found a field of law that interested her, she quickly warmed up to the idea of pursuing a PhD, LLD particularly, focusing on local government law. Placing the LLD on hold, she joined the National Treasury's graduate program in February 2016 and worked uh, in the MFMA implementation unit, as well as the legislative drafting units, which gave her an opportunity to marry theory with practice. In 2018, she was accepted into the clerkship program at the Constitutional Court and spent the year in the chambers of Justice Cameron and Acting Justice Lodo. Towards the end of 2018, with enough persuasion from her current supervisor, she says, friends and former colleagues added, she decided to return to academia to pursue her LLD. She, she rejoined the Dela Omar Institute in January 2019, uh, and she's currently pursuing her LLD, and she is an NGAP lecturer in the faculty's Department of Public Law and Jurisprudence. With a very keen interest in local government law, her thesis seeks to examine the legal and policy framework for differentiated powers and functions of municipalities in South Africa. You might have realized that I've given more attention and more detail to the young and up upcoming academicians that we have on the panel than some of the colleagues, uh, including the former Deputy Chief Justice, and I've done that uh, consciously. Let me mention one final point and I'll, 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 I'll move uh, with the program. In terms of the sequence of things, I will give the opportunity to Justice Moseneke, followed by Judge Saldana, and Lisa Draga will follow, and Tabilo Chonko will, will speak. Finally, at the end, our very good DVC academic Professor Vivian Labak will do some final remarks uh, for us uh, so that uh, we, we close the, the, the event. This event is hosted by and sponsored by the Faculty of Law, UWC, De La Oman Institute, but also the Pan Macmillan uh, Publishers. And I thought that would be the final point that I would mention. Having said this, I'm going to give the opportunity to the former Deputy Chief Justice. The floor is yours, sir. Well, 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 Professor Mesmo, thank you ever so much. I'm truly grateful. It's like being home and um, my relationship you have mentioned with this university. Um, it's a bit of a love affair, isn't it? Because it is really wonderful to be back here and having plugged in, in in a very significant way. Let me start off by bringing my tribute certainly to the Vice Chancellor, um, with whom we have always over the years, Professor Pretorius, discussed and debated a whole range of things. Deputy <clears throat> DVC Lavarque, again, had a long journey over, over, over the years within the field of law. It's wonderful to know that she is here. She'll say something a little later. My good colleague, um, Judge Saldana, uh, with whom we have known each other forever. We were both oppressed, we were both slaves when, when we did all sorts of things and when we established Nadell. And I was the national secretary, founding secretary of Nadell, um, where I, <clears throat> and it's a proud thing I talk about all the time. Professor Jacques de Villa has been always plugged in there. I wrote to him quite early and said, may we do this? Can we think about this? How should we do it? And it's just wonderful that he was so warm, so welcoming, and, um, and look at, at, at where we are. Um, <clears throat> I know that there are, <clears throat> let me start off with Miss Lisa Draga. She hasn't shown her face. I'm sure she will at a little later stage. And it was wonderful to see her blossom at the Constitutional Court where I was engaged and working. And she was there clerking for my good colleague, uh, Zaki Akub. Um, and <clears throat> indeed, Tabile came just after me. As I was leaving, Tabile Konzo came in. And I'm, I'm delighted and looking forward to your remarks this morning. I know there are colleagues of mine who are here. I'll be sex for one, I've noticed. And <clears throat> I know that there have been judges who have been coming around following me. I think to make sure that I say nothing evil about them, and I hope I didn't in the book, in the book itself. I tried to be as gentle and as nice, uh, just so done as I could be. I have only a few things to say, and let me say them quickly because this is an evening where you want to listen to the intergenerational debate. 
but I must again thank UWC. And it's a place in which I found a lot of connect connection. And I cannot stop without acknowledging the Dalla Umar Institute, um, named after a very close friend and comrade and associate of many, many years. We did lots together. And I'm thankful and grateful to be useful in some ways to the law school at UWC. Now I could go on. I mean, I, I know many, many other people, of course, on your, on the university and its leadership. But let me move on. All rise, you all know, follows on my own liberator. And I, I wrestled a lot with the idea of writing about the judiciary. Now, you might well know that judicial memoirs in our country are very scarce. And they've been scarce for reasons which are quite obscure. And one of the reasons might well have been that in the olden days, judges were meant to be cloistered and cloistered forever. They belonged to a monastery, to a nunnery, to some other place of exclusion where they would not say anything about their craft, their responsibilities, there are low points and high points. And, and for that reason, um, perhaps barring Albi Sachs and Edwin Cameron, just about no other person has sat down to take pen and paper, and I hope it's going to happen, where they would talk about their experiences. And I decided to go on a full-blown judicial memoir, um, following really the Chief Justice of the Transvaal, like in 1880, whatever. You know, it is an old, old memoir that we have here. And I thought I would do something different. I was born in the revolution. I grew up in the revolution. And my whole makeup is that little fading hope that we will create a just society. And that we are called by history to do the right things so that we can give a chance to those far less privileged than us with the benefit of a little bit of reading and studying, and therefore a certain qualities of leadership. So I thought having done with Robin Island, with the agony of struggle, with the things we did right through up to the late 80s, I would then talk about the transition within the context of the judicial function. It was important to explain not only the origins of our law, which I do very quickly and briefly, reminding myself that I knew already on Robben Island that, that Roman Dutch law and the common law was a, a colonial imposition. And we can't pretend now that it's something homegrown and wonderful. We keep the wonderful parts we said in our constitution when we re-oxygenated the common law and we throw away all the terrible things, closing the door family as Chief Justice Muhammad once said. So, so it, it was important for me to make that point because I felt even as a young person that no professor of mine has ever said why it is the common law. And I knew it was not common to the oppressed people. It was common to the ruling elite, to the ruling class. And, and, and it was, so there is no hallowed ground of sorts that will never be invaded. The constitution ought to reform the indigenous law, you reform the common law. And I went down to go and show you how in 1994, the task at hand was to reform the judiciary. And one of the ways I, I debated that was to form a new institution, a new court, to find new leaders of our jurisprudence in the hope that we don't leave it in the hands of what I call a, a white male toxic sort of power arrangement. That's really what apartheid was. And, and, and that we would gradually move it to a non-racial space and a reform space. And that's when our president, of course, appoints the first lot of justices at the Constitutional Court, but also on all the other courts. And today you go and look at our courts and you look at the numbers, you must seem very proud because we have a very integrated judiciary actually in this country and people of color way exceed uh, you know, uh, white people on the judiciary, and yet it's still pumping well and doing the work that it has to do. As I say in the book, 
no judicial skies came down. And here we are with Justice Saldan and others, and people of justice, uh, sex and others were writing that. And somebody said to me the other day, oh, it was Tembeka, Mugai Tobi said, you are a Chaskelsonian. You're in love with Chaskelson. And the answer is yes. He was a great chief justice. He was a committed South African. And of course, above all, he recruited me into the judiciary. And he wouldn't want me to go to the SCA and say, no, come straight to the Constitutional Court. I want you here. So I, his intellect was incredible, but that whole team and building a court from ground zero had to be preserved for posterity, I thought. And I take you through the honeymoon time and, and, and move you out of Nelson Mandela saying, let freedom reign, let there be salt, let there be bread. You know, a, a, a victory so glorious, on it the sun should never set. That was Nelson Mandela in full flight, reminding us that we're having a new beginning. And I tell you that young people are challenging that today. I came from the UP the other day and I had quite a turbulent time with all of the young academics taking me on and challenging the premise that 1994 was meaningful and significant in our lives. And then I take you through, right through, running into the Shabir Sheikh case and the world changes and it changes for the judiciary too because so much of our efforts and energies get directed towards dealing with excesses, with executive excesses. But then the court rolls on and I take you through all the chief justices up to uh, Chief Justice Mukwege. It could never be a complete story, but it was meant to raise Professor Mesmur, a number of themes that I know your colleagues are going to pick up on, and I'm not going to go there. But the idea, and starting the book with what Morogoro means for our history, and what it made for me, and the reminder I got about my own obligations, and questioning whether I'd been a good judge or not, and ultimately closing up with a final cry, I think, of a fading revolutionary, urging young people to, to, to know when they are actually not doing well, to know when they are oppressed and, and are in, in an unjust society, and express the hope that they would all rise. They would, they would do what I did when I was a young man. I would tolerate inequality and injustice and unfairness, and I wish that, or oh, that's the curse I throw on the young generation, which you're going to talk with and about today. So that is really what All Rise is. I had no immediate example. There was no precedent, but that's what I've written. And I'm just surprised that it has been for five, seven weeks in a row, a bestseller in the bookshops. So I hope it, it, is, it may be this accessible to our people and they're reading it. It was never meant for judges or lawyers but for our people on the ground, understanding the democratic transition and the democratic project through the judicial eye, might I say, or judicial experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, former Deputy Chief Justice. Uh, that definitely helps us to set uh, the, the ground. Uh, I'm very sure that we will actually come back to some of those themes. Uh, you talked about some of the young people. I mean, people are, some of the young people say, we refer to the 1996 one as the final constitution. Final for who? People are asking. <laughs> that generation. And I'm also glad that you actually mentioned some of the colleagues from Della Omar Institute uh, who had actually played a very important role in the drafting of the constitution. Some of our students, they say black people did not participate in the drafting of the constitution. And I, I also pose the question, are you saying, what are you saying about Della Omar? What are you saying about Kadra Azmal? What are you saying about Brigitte Mabandla and a whole range of other people who were actually at the center of that conversation? I'm going to give the floor to uh, Judge Saldana. Over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Professor Mesmore. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. So tonight I have the privilege of being able to pay tribute not only to a lawyer, but to a judicial mentor. Uh, but I do also have the tremendous honor of doing it in the Dalla Omar Institute. 
And just as Mosineke, the Institute is a crucible for learning and teaching, as you point out in the book of the importance of that. And it is where young people come and they engage with very, very difficult and complex issues facing our, our very young democracy. So I have the privilege of being part of the Dalla Omar Institute as a trustee for many years, but I learn much more from the young people and the thoughts and the challenges than we are ever able to contribute. This is a discussion on intergenerational jurisprudence, constitutionalism, and social justice. And to remind everybody, when, I, when we studied law, in the dark old days of apartheid, constitutional law was a sterile subject. All we were thought were three cases in constitutional law. Harris 1, 1952, Harris 2, 1952, Collins 1 in 1957. There was a sum total of the jurisprudence by the courts in constitutionalism. And then we had, we were taught of positivism as the way to understand law and how many of us grappled and had difficulty with the way our courts were interpreting and applying the laws. And so we looked with great favor on the thinkings and the talkings of people like John Dugard, the naturalists, and they were the shining lights of our, of our young years. And then we went to Anglo-American law and we listened and read about those difficult debates between Hart and Fuller and Hart and Dworkin on issues of positivism and natural law and the difficult issues of morality that faced us as you know students and later in our lives as, as lawyers. Because those raised very hard and very difficult debates for us, particularly when it came to us as young lawyers should we be, as lawyers be respecting the law? Could we possibly respect an unjust legal system? And so those was what confronted us and many people said, well, you study law, you're going to work in the courts and therefore you give legitimacy. And those of us who said, no, no, we will use the law because the law was a tool in which we could use as part of the broader revol revolutionary mo moment. It wasn't the only tool. It was but a small tool. And at the same time, it's appropriate for me to, to recognize the other mentor of ours with us is Judge R.B. Sex, who's somewhere there in the audience. So Justice Mosineke, the, the intergenerational discussion will take place around those broad debates that you raise so crisply in your book and so hard. You confront us with the colonial laws of Roman Dutch and English law, and you challenge us how do we take that and how do we take the values in our constitution? So our constitution is built on values which we as lawyers who like dealing with law, the, the black letter law. But the constitution says to us as judges and as lawyers, there are more important things like values and that is the foundation of how you apply and how you practice law in South Africa. But at the same time, the constitution at least the interim constitution told us about the value of Ubuntu. And the challenge for many young lawyers is how do we begin to understand and develop and weave the notions of Ubuntu into our, into our jurisprudence. And very few judges, I must admit, have embraced the whole notion of Ubuntu as a fundamental value within the broader society in which we're developing our young jurisprudence. Justice Mosineke, I must remind, I must remind you of when we first met. You might have forgotten. I was an article clerk with Rata Mohotleng, who is now a retired judge in North Karateng. And one day he said to me, yeah, Vincent, you have to brief. Uh, and he referred to you then as everybody did very affectionately as Ernest Mosineke. It was before Dikhan. And so I picked up the phone and I phoned you and I said, there's a matter that my principal, Rata Mahotleng, says you have to be briefed. You'll be working with the late Doyen George Bezos. And it was the matter of the late poet, Inguapele Madinguane. And you remember, he was arrested and charged for the illegal possession 
of his own poetry and his own work. And they strung him up on charges in the Johannesburg Magistrates Court. And you and George Bezos swiftly dealt with the matter and he was acquitted. And I remember that because I always go back to the works of, of Ingua Pelan, and he reminds us in that, in that poem that he always recited at funerals and at meetings, Africa my beginning, Africa my ending. So for the young people, that is where my relationship with, with Justice Bosanetti started. But then to crown my, my learning, Justice Mosineke was the admitted me and moved my admission in the Pretoria High Court, Court A in the Palace of Justice. And in the book on page 43, he talks about how evocative the admission of young lawyers and advocates are because he remembers his own journey in that court, in that building where the then Justice Silly did not treat him with any sense of humanity. And how he later had to fight to be admitted as an attorney, and then later as an advocate. Court A, Palace of Justice. And I remember for me, it was a poignant moment in my life. I was going to be admitted and the esteemed justice, but then it was Advocate Mosaneki was going to move my admission. It was a very important moment in my, in my career. We had boycotted our graduations at the various Bush colleges. My mother said, I must at least get the chance to wear it to buy a hat and to wear it. And on that day in Pretoria, outside, she wore a hat because that was our admission. So I, I must thank you once again for moving my admission. But then later we bumped uh, heads together in Adal and BLA in the hard debates of transformation and how we were going to use the law um, as, a, as a terrain of struggle. And um, then many years in Adal and then the new constitution, and then we start nagging you and bothering you. I remember two calls where I also called you and said, um, Advocate Mosinek, is it, Nadal would like to nominate you to go to the, to, to, to the judiciary. And you repeatedly and very principally said, not now. So we never gave up because you said not now, we knew you would come someday. So that takes us, that takes me on my journey with you. But to come to the book, Justice Mosaneke, it is an absolute literary delight. Lawyers don't speak in literary tones. We, we write very bland, uh, desolate uh, judgments that just deals with the law and deals with the facts. What the book teaches us is that, is that lawyers and judges can talk with a sense of literary flair. And that's what you do and you do so beautifully. But the book is also an anthology. It's an anthology to ordinary South Africans of what is the law about? From the most basic things that you explain to us, you tell us the difference between an attorney and an advocate. You tell us the difference between civil proceedings and criminal proceedings and public law. You tell us, you tell the public what the prince of the doctrine of stare decisis is, the doctrine of precedent and why it's important. You also tell us about the, the debates between the common law and, and the constitutional law. But most important, what I take from the book as a judge is that it sets out the ethical basis for judicial life. And repeatedly in the book, chapter after chapter, it says, what are the ethics of a judge? What are the ethics of lawyers? And importantly, you make the point that a judge owes fidelity to no one else except the constitution and the law, not to any political party. And that was a seminal part of your life in the new South Africa, Justice Mosineke. And that's a seminal learning for us as, as judges and as lawyers. We owe fidelity only to the constitution, nobody else. And that then develops the whole theme of judiciary and accountability. And you deal with that in the book so beautifully about how judges need to be accountable through their judgments, which must be timeless, which must be clear, and which must be addressed to the people that are before you as the litigants. So the crucial thing I take from the book is the ethics of a judge and the accountability of a judge. And then if you, you, you tell us very beautifully about the difference of the way judgments are written in the high court 
and judgments are written in the constitutional court. And we get to peek, as you politely say, we get to peek into the constitutional court judgment making and, and writing. In the high court, we, all do it, we do it alone. It's an individual exercise and we might uh, bounce off an idea with a colleague here or there, but there's a discipline in the constitutional court which you share about us. It is the collective discipline of the judgment writing, but at the same time respecting and upholding the individual's decision-making process. And that I think the public hears for the first time. The window is opened on the constitutional court and we see the judges in their table, discussing, debating, disagreeing, changing the commas, writing, getting the grammar, but more importantly, getting the judgment right and making sure that the values in the constitution underpin their judgment. And that to us, it's an important lesson for us in all of the other courts. Let me say this, Judge Mosineke, I wish every judge in this country would read the book Old Rise. I wish every lawyer, every law student should read the book Old Rise. So I want to end and just say that <clears throat> coming into the judiciary and coming into law, we are faced in the new South Africa with, with huge challenges, issues of ethics, issues of our foundations of this new judiciary. And I always go back when we debate with colleagues about what could we have done differently in 1994, 1995. And the debate always is reduced to, should the judges of the apartheid state have gone to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission? And that's a debate that engages us as then, it's a debate that will engage us now and into the future. Did we allow the judges of the past not to go to the, to the Truth Commission and not just in the writing that they did in the, and the submissions that they made in writing in a really bland way, but they should have gone to explain what they did under apartheid, because that would have been the foundations for us. More importantly, it would have been the foundations like Judge Ackerman who goes or writes to the Truth Commission and he says, I was complicit and I apologize to the people of South Africa for what I did. And we read what Judge Pius Langa writes and he talks poignantly about, as a young South African, the past system and how it humiliated him and what it meant to him to be to practice law under apartheid. And then we get some judges who still can't come to terms with the fact that they, they should have been held accountable for what happened under apartheid. But those are important debates that the young people are going to challenge us. And I know that the Lisa Dragas and the Tabiras are going to say to us in years to come, why did you allow this? But we say there were other more important things for us to do and we tried to build an ethic of a new judiciary and then you beautifully take us through how the court and the character of the court from Cheskelson to Langa to Ngobo and to Mokweng Mokweng. And you characterize the jurisprudence and the courts during those periods but you weave your own jurisprudence and you weave your own character and your own leadership into all of those time periods, those great epochs of Cheskelson, of Langa, of, Saint, of uh, Ngobo, and now with Mokweng. And lastly, let me say, the end of the book to me is one of the more, one of the more profound readings that I've had to deal with. And it is Life Essi Domaini because that is where our democracy went wrong. And judge, justice, what you do, you say with absolute humanity, this is what we did wrong to vulnerable people. This is what our government did wrong. And this is what we must make right because we will make mistakes in our, in our democracy. And what you point out to us is that democracy is fragile, but must get the foundations right. And what this book becomes an important brick in the foundation for judges and lawyers and to all South Africans so that we don't repeat the same mistakes that we've made over the past 25 years. We will make mistakes, but we dare not repeat those that we've made again. And for that, your book plays an important role or should play an important role in the life of every judge. And for that, I thank you, Justice Mosinekin. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Judge Saldana, for that uh, 
beautiful input, not just only in terms of the lessons that you actually draw uh, from, from the book, but what should actually resonate uh, with the new generation. And you, you've, you've also mentioned some of the points that the new generation, including the two colleagues that we have on the panel today, should actually uh, uh, try to address uh, and try to push the boundaries with in terms of uh, Ubuntu and uh, the responsibilities of judges, the ethics of judges. In fact, the book even goes beyond the ethics of judges. It also talks about civil responsibility. Uh, I have had the occasion to uh, listen to Justice Mos Seneke speaking about the whole notion of delivery, that you just sit home and you don't lift a finger and what that actually means uh, for the lived reality of people in the country uh, as, as, as we have it now. I have seen uh, that there are a couple of names that I recognize. Uh, I have seen that the former Minister of Finance, uh, Mr. Trevor Emanuel, has posed the question. Uh, I'm glad to recognize uh, his presence in the room, but also Justice Abi Sachs, that was already mentioned earlier. Without taking much time, I'm going to hand over to the next generation. We've actually said that it's intergenerational. We started with uh, the former Deputy Chief Justice, Jack Saldana. Next is Lisa Draga. The floor is yours. Evening, everyone. Um, evening, Judge. I seem to be having some difficulty connecting with my video. Uh, it says that the host has stopped it. Um, nonetheless, I thought, I'll... I thought Lisa, you're keeping away intentionally. <laughs> must have seen I didn't... enough of me at the court, uh, but we hope to see your face sometime. There, there go. we go. There we go. You see my face now, Judge. Oh, lovely. Yes. Very good to see you indeed. Uh, thank you, Judge, for a um, very interesting read. Um, unlike Professor Mesma, I do not intend to give my copy, my free copy, to anyone. Um, I was very, very excited when I was asked to read your book because it was an excuse to finally read something other than thesis-related information. So it was a nice escape for me. And so when I undertook my task, I got my pencil and I got my sticky tape and I was ready to find my questions that I intend to ask you. And it was about five pages in when my first sticky tape uh, found its way onto your book. And that is something that both yourself and Justice Saldana has already um, covered to a certain extent uh, in both of your remarks thus far. Um, Justice Saldana spoke about the foundations of law and how you practice law. And it was really uh, profound for me to, to read uh, how you would have had to pass Afrikaans, English and Latin in order to be able to access your law degree. And how you were so conscious from, such an, from, from the outset that this was a colonial imposed curriculum. I wish that I had had that level of consciousness. Unfortunately, uh, I cannot claim it. Um, and so you got me thinking quite deeply. Um, and immediately the first thing that came to mind was when I started as a lecturer at UWC about three years ago, I found myself in so many spaces where the question was constantly thrown around uh, decolonization and what is decolonization and what is a decolonized legal curriculum. And the one thing that I have discovered is that despite all these amazing legal minds, no rough consensus could really be reached on what a decolonized curriculum entails. And I also speak from the perspective of someone who has witnessed all of these cases coming to the courts around universities and language policies um, and the controversy around that, um, given your personal experience on the language barrier issue. And I was just hoping as a young lecturer judge that I could um, tap into your wisdom as to how precisely do I go about formulating my decolonized legal curriculum in my decolonized uh, course outline? What, what would that decolonized legal curriculum look like? Um, and then my other question that arises from this is around the issue of multilingualism, um, 
I mean, nationally, we have a policy that favors multilingualism in higher education. But we, of course, haven't, uh, we're not, we yet to see this. And we speak about historically disadvantaged languages. And it's quite clear that these are not just historically disadvantaged languages, that these are languages that continue to be disadvantaged. And I'd just be interested to gain your insight as to how we could potentially overcome this barrier uh, within legal education, particularly because uh, as a member of the Student Affairs Committee and the Student Assessment Committee, um, a pattern has emerged when I examine student transcripts and I often see that students uh, are able to um, do fairly well, relatively well on the legal content courses and yet are failing the first, perhaps second year of law because of English and being unable to pass uh, English for law students at the first year level. And so I'm very interested in knowing how is it that we can finally overcome this uh, huge obstacle to accessing law, which you had to face back then and which my students continue to face now. Thank you very much, um, Lisa, um, for raising practical uh, issues that uh, are faced in the classroom that are important for the young and the, the upcoming uh, generation. That is a beneficiary of le legal education. Uh, but also emphasizing some of the issues pertaining to uh, language policy and so forth. And I think the book uh, touched on some of the education related jurisprudence that uh, the former Deputy Chief Justice has been uh, central to. Uh, but I have no doubt that we will actually come to uh, these issues in the reflection. If you permit me, last but not least, our colleague, Tabile Chonko, uh, you have the floor. And Lisa, if you can keep the video on, we would be much grateful. Thank you. <laughs> Tabile, it's uh, over to you. Good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me, Prof Mesma. Loud and clear. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, Judge Sardana. Good evening, DCJ. Um, good evening, first and foremost, thank you for pronouncing my surname correctly, DCJ. <laughs> A lot of people struggle with that one, so thank you for that. I appreciate it. <laughs> And just secondly, before I get into it, um, I must say, um, in, in the book, you mentioned a moment when you were nominated to take up a seat in the Constitutional Court when it was just newly formed and how um, at the interview stage, you grew cold feet and you withdrew from it. And I must say, I felt the same way when I was approached to be on this panel. I found myself feeling like, whoo, this is a lot, <laughs> you know, but um, I'm thankful for those who pushed me and propelled me. And um, yes, so um, I, I think on my part, um, Justice, equally to the rest of the panelists, it, it was a very interesting book. And had I not had the experience to be at the Constitutional Court, that walk being held by the hand and taken through the judges conference and how everything goes from application stage to sit down, you know, I would have felt like I am at the Constitutional Court. I am part of it had I not experienced it. You know? um, so one of the things that struck me and a lot struck me in the book, just like Lisa, I have my sticky notes, I have my mind maps, just trying to figure out the sequence. But what struck me in the book is a part where you spoke about how Judge Kiss had made a remark to you and said that he wasn't a fan of the new constitution and found it very vague and open-ended and difficult to implement. And you stood your ground and said you'd completely disagree with that statement. And then I look at everything else that has happened in the face of us having the constitution. And also having heard some of those similar statements from practitioners and laypersons, you know, people who've asked, what is the point of having this 
amazing constitution that tells us about our rights of access to water, our rights of access to housing, when a good 25 years into democracy, we still don't have access to those rights. What is the point when the executive that is meant to be implementing these rights and taking reasonable steps is not doing anything? How do you tell someone who, you know, 25 years later, they have a communal tap that has run dry in the wake of coronavirus where you have to wash your hands for 20 seconds continuously, how do you tell that person that there's a constitution that says you have a right of access to water? You know, how do you tell someone that you have a right of access to dignity when not so long ago we got to see the city of Cape Town's metropolis tarnish the dignity of a man, completely tarnish his dignity, bulldoze his shack, render him homeless, and yet the constitution says there's a right to dignity. So how do we reconcile what's in the constitution with what should be happening on the ground? You know, in 2020, we still have these things happening. And now looking back at your disagreement with Judge Kess, how do you address that? Why did you disagree, especially in the face of what's happening now in our country? Why would you disagree to that? And I don't know if I have the floor to follow up on that or I should give it to the judge to respond. Because like I said, my sticky notes are ready, judge. Thank you very much. As I said at the beginning, uh, the, the priority is going to be uh, to the young generation academics that we have here. But of course, uh, at a later stage, I'll be taking some questions that are coming in uh, from the chat. But uh, Justice Moseneke, um, if you want to come in now, it's perfectly fine, and we can tackle some of these issues, and we can give the opportunity again uh, to Tabile and, and, and Lisa, uh, or uh, Judge Saldana. Yes, I, I certainly would like to do that. <clears throat> and, and starting off with, obviously, total gratitude um, to my colleague, friend, and comrade, <clears throat> Judge Saldana. <clears throat> Vincent and I have known each other for long as you've heard, and I'm grateful for the, the thoroughness with which you have worked through the book. It was meant to be that. It was meant to be that easy bedtime read. And to fudge the line between judge-like behavior and, and real life. So in the language was intended to allow everybody to access it and read it quite easily. But thank you for that wonderful tribute. Now, Lisa, <clears throat> let me say, <clears throat> you start with the book starts and let me let, let me get back to that when i was young of course i was on robin island and understand you probably were some in cape town starting to become a lawyer and the notion that <clears throat> excuse me pardon me we were a conquered people with a legal system that was an incident and an outcome of our colonial conquest came readily to me because remember, young as I was and being on Robben Island, we, we, we were taught to understand that we are displaced, we are without honor, without dignity, with, and without any of the good things that make up a good life. Because in the first instance, we were a conquered people and we were colonized and that therefore, and when you come to your question of decolonization, and that therefore we had to remedy that. So, and understood that therefore, the law therefore required me to study Latin, English, and Afrikaans, Netherlands, because, or Netherlands, as it was called then, precisely because I had to access foreign material. And, and it didn't escape me that if you call the law common law, it's common to whom? It's common to the rulers never was common to, to the, those who were ruled. And I give you examples very quickly and passing examples. Muslim marriages were not recognized. Marriages under Hindu, Hindu rights were not recognized. Marriage under traditional indigenous law were not recognized. In fact, and the consequences were that we were all illegitimate, in essence, married out of wedlock. And, and, and there was a slippery slope towards us losing our dignity. Now, so, for me, it, it became quite poignant. And I think 
my complaint is that my professors and judges and all pretended that it's one holy place which nobody ought to touch, which with respect is nonsense. Uh, and, and, and you see that resistance in the legal culture, which I talk about um, early, many of the judges resisted the constitution and that it was the true and only source of all law and that indigenous law, private law, any other law, draws its legitimacy from the will of the people as expressed in the constitution. Because the constitution contains our most recent recordal of the common convictions of our people. And it came out of a democratic outcome. We can debate that, I know some people contest that, but we can debate that some other time. So Lisa, for that reason, when I start thinking about a decolonized legal, legal um, um, program or syllabus, the starting point should be that candor, the honesty that you don't have, that our common law has its origin in 1600 Europe. And it was brought to us the way it is. We have chosen in 1994 to keep it. And that is fine, let's tick that box. But it must be kept only to the extent that it accords with the fundamental values that we have chosen to be governed under. So you can't, for instance, have a notion of, let me give an example of property. That reflects a feudal system. Under property law, all you have to allege is I'm owner and the rest is added unto you. The owner shifts, the person in occupation must demonstrate why they're in occupation and they, they must show that, the, you know, some entitlement to invade your, your total dominium, if you remember the word which was used. And our new notions of property are more socialized notions that Property is actually there, you own it, you have a higher right, but other people too may be able to enjoy the property. And hence, and that we draw from our constitution. Nobody can be evicted without a court order. Nobody can be evicted unless certain things are in place. There we have modulated the common law to be, to accord with. So in short, what I'm saying is this, is that 1994 was meant to introduce a transformative arrangement where we change our society. The common law is entitled so to indigenous talk. Indigenous law, Ms. Tongso, can say to us only men can inherit from their parents, right? And we struck that down because indigenous law was not consistent with our notions of gender equality and that freedom is indeed for women foremost than men. And there's no way you can leave women poorer and poorer by by disinheritance. We said the same thing about Islamic law. So the same thing, other systems where women are actually kept out of proprietary privileges that would give them a better position. So when we decolonize law, in my view, you firstly candidly acknowledge its origin and how it was around us. Two, you test all laws against the highest values that we have inducted. Those old lawyers and judges who never went to the TRC always said the starting point is a common law. And they would say to me, how dare you give damages under the constitution? That's exactly where the damages ought to be granted. That is the source of our law. And the argument somebody asked me in the midst of free state, the similar did. But, but damages give justice, the only place you can give damages is under common law. How could we possibly say that and render our constitution meaningless, powerless, without any ability to bring remedy to people who died in life as a demanding? So decolor, it's, it's freeing the law from its imposition position and understanding that we have created a higher platform against which we should test the things we do. 
I, I can go on forever here. I'll come, if you invite me, Lisa, to come and teach in your class. I wrote a, a judgment called Fanamaba in which the common law prevented women from suing their spouses in certain circumstances. And I said, no, 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 no. Not so long ago, I said, I reminded somebody, the common law declared men to be the administrator of the estate. That's reeking patriarchy. Not so long ago, the common law held that a man may not be charged for raping his wife. You can't rape your wife. It's a legal impossibility. It meant that women give permission permanently. So as long as we can get it right, we're not dealing with some hallowed space here which may not be touched. And there was a problem until Arthur Chaskelson, the great chief justice said, there's only one law here. It's a fundamental statement. We're in the same neighborhood here. There's no administrative law out of the common law and administrative law out of the constitution. This is one neighborhood, it's one democracy. So it's quite important, I think, the question you asked, I'm sorry I was too long on that, that we should look up to our common values and then try and, and change our society, recognizing where we come from and where we, we're trying to go to. Josh van de Kors, yes, Ms. Tonko, said to me, doesn't like the constitution because it's too open-ended. Now there are two kinds of lawyers. There could be a few other kinds. But the kind of lawyers who think law is a rule-based exercise and that the rules trump everything else and if the rules produce an injustice, so be it, then the law is an S, A double S, and you have to follow it that way. And there are judges who believe that law serve one particular purpose. I happen to be one of them. And that is bring, to bring just outcomes, to change society, to improve it, to make our lives better. And that law must float on a bed of morality. Law is not devoid of morality. Apartheid was devoid of all morality. They could make a law through positivism that women and two thirds of what men end. And that was law, it couldn't be challenged. People of color were going to stay there and nowhere else and the law allows it and that's the law, you must follow it. So that literalist tradition of positivism that's what we unseated in 1994. And a big part of the world is moving in that direction to look at those values that matter in creating a just society. So black letter law is appropriate in a few isolated cases, but our primary job is to produce just outcomes as we, we practice and exercise law. So I think Justice Van Dekos was a bright, positivist, um, black letter law, which I'm not, and many other lawyers are not. We show fidelity to the law. We read the law as best as we can to give effect to the will of the people in parliament. But at the same time, we subject all of that to the higher values that we chose for ourselves in the constitution. Too long an answer, I'm afraid, Professor I, uh, Mesma, I must stop off now. But that's how strongly I feel about that. And there is room for decolonization, I think, in our curricula. As we push, the last point that you made was, oh, look at where we are, look how terrible we are, look how poor we are, we have no access to water. Look how badly the executive behaves from time to time. Look at how our treasury is raided and so on. How dare we talk about the constitution? And I was saying to some young people at law school in Pretoria just the other day, you see, if you take any script, say the Holy Quran, or you take the Gita or the Bible, or whatever else you want to go to, that's where we choose to set the high end of the things that we value. Our obligation is then to fashion our conduct in a way that tries to achieve these high values. Our constitution in the world 
that's why it's not just a liberal constitution around the corner. I reject that notion. It's one of the few countries in the world that says you have a right of access to water. You have a right of access to healthcare. If it wasn't there, where would the TAC case be? It's one of those that says you have a right of access to education and a near absolute right to access to basic education. Now those are very vital social justice objectives that tabile we should not throw out with the, you know, with the bath water. We must hold the executive to account, government to behave properly. We must point out the things you are pointing out, but let's not collapse the high mission of the constitution with the low disgusting performance of those who wield power and must change the lives of the vulnerable. There is a difference there. And we should, and we who are lawyers should hold those who will public power to the highest standard, not the lowest standard. And the constitution serves as that. We shouldn't trash it because we need it. And we fought many, many years to introduce those values and entitlements that you see in the constitution. It's the people who are not doing what they should do and not the high hopes that we have written down as our constitution. I think I'm gonna stop there. I wanted to more to listen than to speak today. I'm afraid I'm preaching now. Sorry about that. Thank you very much, um, former Deputy Chief Justice. We're perfectly fine and I can confirm that I can listen to you uh, much longer. <laughs> uh, and I also appreciated uh, the extent to which the examples uh, resonate very well uh, in the environment that we're operating now uh, with COVID, uh, with gender-based violence, uh, and some of the issues that are relevant even as we speak uh, today. I want to give the opportunity back uh, to uh, Tabile. Uh, I know that you were still uh, building some of your points. You can come back to some of the additional points, but Lisa also, if you want to, uh, and maybe at uh, in the next round, I will come to some of the questions uh, from the chat, but I've also received one uh, through email. I'll come to that as well. Tabile? Um, thank you, Professor Mesma, and uh, thank you, DCJ, for that. <laughs> um, I'll just pick out one question from the many that I have, and um, it's it's a question that you bring up, or rather um, a story that you tell us about the miscarriage of justice, and you give us a the case in which you witnessed the miscarriage of justice um, experienced by Mr. Mulawuzi. Um, you say very um, interesting words there, and you mention that um, to err is human, and that judges do make mistakes. And, and that is very true. For those who haven't, I won't waste time into getting into it so people can go and buy the book, but it's a really interesting scenario about miscarriage of justice. But when, when I read that, you know, I, I wanted to get a bit more from you, Justice, on your thoughts and perhaps your, your feelings. And yes, feelings, because I feel that judges do have feelings, even though you have to divorce yourself and be objective and be impartial and independent when you educate matters. But what are your feelings when, when that happens, when, when a judge at the constitutional court or the entire bench realizes that we perhaps should have taken a different decision than the one that we had taken, or we were wrong, you know, or I was wrong as a judge, and perhaps I should have gone with a, a different judgment. And you also raised the case of um, Pauls v. Robertson, and you give us a bit, a bit of a, yeah, a teaser and say that if you had given the opportunity, you would decide the case differently. And that got me thinking, why? <laughs> why would you do so? What happens in those times when judges realize that we might have made a mistake, the process, the feelings around it. And I'm interested in just that, Justice. Thank you very much, uh, 
uh, tabulae. Also for emphasizing the point that judges are human beings and they have feelings. Uh, one of the interesting parts from the book is when Justice Moseneke speaks about how the issue about sex, religion, and politics is banned from the chitty chats that judges would have. Usually the filler is sports. Uh, but I can already anticipate some ways how sports can also be politicized, but we're not going to get uh, into that. I want to give the opportunity to Lisa if you want to build uh, on any of the previous points, and then I'll give the floor back to uh, the former Deputy Chief Justice. I feel like Tabile has uh, harangued uh, Justice there with so many um, intense questions. Um, I do have one that relates to that, and then I'll try and take it into a lighter note and be a little easier on you, Judge. Um, one of the things that you mentioned was whether judges could be um, both unbiased and pro-poor. And I found that quite profound. I was like, wow, how do you do that? Um, and I know that you mentioned that you had spoken about it at some event, but for those of us who haven't read your paper, I'd be very interested in hearing a little bit about that. And then on my lighter note, um, I've got two things. So my first LOL moment in reading your book, and judge that's laugh out loud in case you're not clued up with the WhatsApp speak. <laughs> uh, my first LOL moment was when you spoke about uh, judges and what they cannot afford to do. And you said that judges cannot afford to suffer from intellectual constipation or a pen that runs dry. Uh, and aside from laughing, that made me think about a question that I had asked Justice O'Regan about almost a decade ago. So no pressure in terms of your answer. Um, and that question is, some of us are not judges, judges. some of us are academics. Some of us are PhD students who can totally relate to a dry pen. Um, and some of us are legal practitioners, young legal practitioners that face drafting complex affidavits and are incredibly intimidated. And so my question to you is, what do you do? What advice can you give to those of us who find ourselves suffering from writer's block and enduring intellectual constipation? And then I've got one more. Can I throw in one more, Judge? <laughs> My one more is that you say in the book that um, judges don't find cases. Cases find judges. So that made me think about if you could find a case, if you could look for a case, what would that case look like? And what would that order seek, that request for relief seek? Thank you very much, uh, Lisa, for those uh, interesting and important questions. I'm going to give the floor back to the former Deputy Chief Justice. But Judge Saldana, uh, after just Justice Moseneke speaks, if you want to weigh in, uh, I also have uh, the, the pleasure to give you the opportunity. Justice Moseneke? Professor Mesma, I uh, thank you for getting me back here and um, getting these young academics to uh, chase me down the, down the road. Uh, let me start with. Um, judicial fallibility. The examples I give were to make a very important point that must be, you know, droning in the minds of many members of our public. And the point is that there's no assumption that judges are infallible. No such assumption. The assumption, if anything, the whole judicial system, you remember I explained that, is structured on the notion that uh, judges are fallible and we create a sieve. The first instance, it would be a magistrate sitting alone and you move on, you could the high court, a judge would sit alone. And then if there's an appeal in the high court, three judges sit. So you pray and hope that three minds be brought to bear on the same issue, same fact, same law. And then you move, let's say, to the SCA, five judges now sit on the same matter. It was said by the magistrate, by high court judge, by full bench of the high court. Now it's before five judges in the Supreme Court of Appeal and 11 judges in the Constitutional Court. 
So I said, pains to explain that architecture. It's like a sieve that gets finer and finer. And the whole attempt is to try and exclude judicial error. And to make that point, I had to go through the painful admission and to, to display humility, hopefully, about the constitutional court just going down a wrong path and somebody stays in jail for quite a long time. As you saw, I relate to the, those facts in there of Mr. Mlaozi. And we should have stopped it on the system. As this other cause faltered, we should have been a little more able to catch the fallout and we did not. And it was, it was a painful part of writing, acknowledging that it, it, and it is a good thing that judges should get that humility back, back to them. We have enormous power. We can affect lives of people. And yet we should, in fact, one older, wiser judge once said to me, you know, you feel so strong, Museneke, that you're right, but there's an equal chance that you are wrong. It's all on balance, 50-50. You could be just as wrong as you think you are right. So it's just a, an important thing. It's also important in our lives to show and display some humility the way we go about it. And we're exercising power as judges. And I wanted to make that point Tabile, and to be able to misconstrue, to show judicial fallibilities ever present. Yes, I talk about folks. I made an error. I should have been more progressive in my, in my stance on folks versus Robinson. And I voted with the majority. And I confessed to the fact that my guts were down. Called up again, I would decide it differently pretty much the same point to say there are certain things that I would have done differently. And again, human fallibility comes in, but the system is meant to eradicate it. And um, one of the reasons why we don't want capital punishment is that sometimes we could have sentenced Mr. Mlausi to death. And look at there, the error would have been horrible, isn't it? He stayed for 10 years in prison, <clears throat> having gone through up to the constitutional court. I want to move on to being unbiased and pro-poor. I think the point I was making there, Ms. Drago, was that our constitution is a transformative constitution. It's a post-conflict document. It is very intent on equalizing society and rearranging the power <clears throat> project within society to introduce them. So that is why it goes out of his way to say, there shall be water for the poor. There shall be a place to rest for the poor. That is not a promise to everybody, by the way. You can't walk up to court and say, I demand access to a home. If you have one already, you may not do that. So in that sense, our arrangement was meant to help those who are excluded by the past system to be able to migrate into a better space. And, and it's a, therefore it's a pro-poor constitution. It's a never, never constitution as Nelson Mandela told us. One that's intent on changing lives. And Ms. Comte will say, well, you've done nothing. People are still poor. But the point is that is, that is the litmus. That is the people living in Cape Town. That is the something that holds a beacon somewhere in the sea. In Robben Island, I always saw, can't remember what they call it now, but it's something that sits a lighthouse. It's a lighthouse that stands high up in the sea to be able to indicate directions to people. And so too were the values of our long struggle. The values of freedom, of, 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 of inclusivity, of, of social justice, of being kind to each other, having full regard to everybody, um, as a full human being. So it is a pro-poor constitution in that sense. The other constitutions which are neutral about many things that our constitution is vocal about. Some just promise equality, stop. And there's formal equality. We try and do more than that because of the devastation of colonialism and apartheid. 
Whether we, we get in there, we can have that debate. The, the last point, of course, you say that judges, intellectual constipation, Lisa, uh, I was talking about how judges sometimes run, pants run dry. Ask Justice Saldana, ask any judge will tell you. Um, ask, ask any judge who's there, ask Justice Sex or whoever else. Justice O'Regan, you work for Justice Yakub. Um, you have an obligation to explain yourself to those that you want to, for instance, sentence to jail for life. And you better get it right. And when judges get run into that, they get into what I call intellectual constipation sometimes. Their pants run dry. And I pray that all judges don't suffer from intellectual constipation because they can't account in any other way except writing and saying, why, how, why do they exercise power? Judicial power is public power. And it has to be seen to be exercised properly. So I give examples of judges. Remember Justice Madala said, you know, uh, Chief Justice say, well, Tolly Madala, how long is your pipeline? He says, Chief Justice, pipelines are notoriously long. So it might be very long before I get a judgment out. But we actually have to be diligent, to produce judgments, because we owe it to the people, to your country. And lastly, I thought, which case do I, would I want to find me? I've answered that in some other place. It is so that we don't find cases. Even those who call us counter-revolutionary and what else, we don't do anything to go out there and look for cases in order to be bad to them or nasty to anybody. The cases are brought to judges. And it's a good thing that cases are brought. In some jurisdictions, judges go to the street and go and find cases. In hours, you wait and wait until they're brought to you. So, Ms. Batoy, that is what my wish would be. If I was, I was 15 years on the bench and I've never sentenced one person for appropriation of public funds. And I was asked, do you have any regret? That is my regret. That is the case that should have come to me. Mr. Silebi's case came when I was on the court. But that was not a case of public appropriation of funds. It was a mafia who were trying to bribe the police commissioner. And I was on the panel that refused the appeal. Mr. Shabir Sheikh's case also came to the court, but as a case of a businessman who was trying to show favors to a politician. So if any case were to come to me, it would be one in which the evidence would demonstrate abuse of money that we have collectively saved so that we can bring water to the people in the villages. That's the kind of case I would have wanted. My term is done. I never got it. <laughs> so that's my answer. Thank you very much, uh, former Deputy Chief Justice. Uh, much appreciated for those comments. There are a number of things that you're very much grateful about that you reflect in the book. Uh, and one of them is where you say you had to be part of a pro-poor uh, pro court. Uh, and I think it resonates very well with what you just said. And you also try to emphasize the point, and I quote, you said, I strove to support the transformation project to make our country reflect the text and living spirit of our constitution, end of quote. And I think what you just said now also resonates absolutely uh, very well with that, uh, with that remark that you're very grateful about that you indicate in the book. But I'm going to give the opportunity to Judge Saldana and uh, Tabile Chonko uh, will also have the opportunity before I open the floor for uh, comments. But before I give the floor to Judge Saldana, I want to recognize uh, the fact that uh, our rector, Professor Pretorius, uh, has joined uh, beginning from uh, around uh, uh, seven o'clock. So I just want to recognize his presence uh, in this chat. Judge Saldana, over to you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, could I touch on just a few issues raised by both Lisa and Tabile? <clears throat> the whole yes. issue of decolonizing the law. Um, really, very difficult concept for us as judges and lawyers to deal with. But I do think that there are two dimensions to it. The one is how do we substantively decolonize the law, meaning how do we transform the law? And Justice Mosaneke has pointed out how the constitution is transformative, how we change the law, 
through the values in the constitution, the rights in the constitution, and hopefully that begins to transform the law. So all of these law reports sitting at the back of me, all of that is, much of it is untransformed colonial law. And the challenge for us is how do we change that to the books on the other side, which are the law reports of the constitutional court and the law reports of post-1994. But besides the substantive part of decolonization, there's another part called decolonization also. Remember, the only reason I suspect I'm a judge is because of section 174 in the constitution. They had to make the judiciary representative of the people of South Africa. I claim no great legal mind to being appointed um, because of uh, great uh, academic or intellectual thought. I'm a judge because the JSCs were charged with the responsibility of appointing fit and proper South Africans that are representative. Why I say that is, and why it's important for decolonization, I sit in an office now as a judge. Before 1994, I would never be able to enter into a judge's office. Attorneys were never allowed into judges' chambers. Only advocates were. And many advocates didn't challenge the fact that attorneys were not allowed to accompany them into the office of, of judges. We tried sometimes to enter the offices of the old judges and they put us out unceremoniously. So what we do today is that we invite attorneys to come into our, into our chambers and they participate fully with us and with the advocates before us. That's the one part, it's a small part. The other is the way we address and judge, Justice Mosaneke deals with it in the book. In the high courts and in the magistrates courts, they refer to us as lords and ladies and worships and honors. When it's constitutional court says, no, 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 that is the past. That's part of our English colonial the tradition of lords and ladies. We wear the cloaks of the English courts, red for crime and very dark black for dealing with civil matters. We haven't even transformed our own cloaks to reflect our Africanness. There's not a single color in our cloaks to represent the great wonder, the, 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 the lots of wonder of color that our dress as African people are. So when we talk about decolonization, it's not just in the substantive part of the law, but it is what our judges look like on a daily basis and how our judges behave. There's the second issue to talk about demystification. You know, the fascinating thing about the COVID pandemic is that it's taught ordinary South Africans to talk about two very important concepts, legality and rationality. It's fascinating. You, you talk to people and they say, the ban on tobacco, the ban on alcohol, it's irrational. It's unlawful. And the fascinating part is that ordinary South Africans are beginning to think and say, can we hold government accountable for the decisions they make has been rational, has been legal. And that's the fascinating part when you allow the public to begin to debate their hard and very complex issues that judges and lawyers are faced with on, on a day-to-day -day basis. So COVID has taught us a few things. It has taught us that ordinary people can engage and say, let's look at why does government in this lockdown ban alcohol and cigarettes and uh, people talk about the rationality. There's ex-ministers who give lessons on, on the rationality. But this is where we are in South Africa. There's great and wonderful debates. The debates about separation of powers People are always saying, should judges be doing that? Should the legislature be doing that? Should government, should the executive be doing that? People are engaging with the, with the new speak of separation of powers, of rationality, and the role of, the role of judiciary. The last point I want to make about, and that is the writings of judges and when are you, uh, when does your pen run dry? So I share an anecdote with you when I was at the LRC uh, in management, and we had to put a performance appraisal system for all the lawyers. 
And one of the lawyers who was at the LRC was the late George Bezos. Now, who could performance manage George Bezos? Totally impossible. And so George Bezos said to us, he said, law is an art. Don't expect me to come to work at nine o'clock. When I'm ready to create, I will come to work. See, but judges can't say when I'm ready to create a judgment, I will write a judgment because as Justice Posaneke has pointed out, there are accountability measures. There's norms and standards for judges. We have to write our judgments within three months. Otherwise, you'll read about it on the WhatsApp and you'll read about it on the, um, in the newspapers that this division has so many outstanding judgments and this judge has got a judgment in excess of four or five or six, some judges over a year. But it raises the issue of accountability. But it does raise the very difficult issue about when your pen runs dry, because it's very, very difficult writing judgments, as the book tells us. It is an intractable process of making the decision. But it's the discipline of accountability that judges must write their judgments. So whilst law is an art, we have to make sure we perform that art within three months. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Judge Saldana, for emphasizing a number of points, including the decolonization debate. Uh, it's a debate that we continue to have in a very meaningful manner at uh, UWC, and we, we look forward to, and we continue to contribute to that debate. But also some of the lessons that we've actually learned from the COVID pandemic, the, the legality, uh, rationality, uh, and a number of other uh, uh, issues. I'm going to give the opportunity to uh, Tabile. I understand she has uh, uh, one point that she wants to bring to the table about, the, about Judge Lope. Uh, the floor is yours and then I promise I will immediately move to the chat boxes and I'm going to bring some of the questions and uh, Justice Mosaneke, I have to warn you some of the comments that questions that are coming from uh, from the young uh, students from UWC and, and even beyond are going to be very interesting pushing the boundaries and I have no doubt that you'll reflect on them as graciously as you always do. Tabile over to you. Thank you Prof Mesma. Um... It w I would feel absolutely devastated if I did not ask about the Shope chapter, DCJ. <laughs> it was a very interesting chapter to read and, 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 and I found myself reconciling what she had said in one of the chapters when you spoke about the neglect by the legislature in omissions, the failure of not doing anything or not doing anything which resulted in um, um, a bad result for the country. And, and then I read the Chope chapter and I felt like that too was a form of neglect, but I couldn't quite pin it, whether to say it's a neglect from the JSC that hasn't pushed for the finality of this matter or a neglect on the part of the justices who also had set back and not really given the information that was required perhaps for the matter to be finalized. And, and I just found myself really puzzled at how such a clear matter, as you stated, the issue is quite clear, but somehow it was cluttered with all the technicalities and procedures. And my question really for you is at this point, with 11 years down the line, who do we hold accountable? for this omission? Who do we hold accountable for the fact that the Chope matter still lays open? And yet again, this year in February, we saw an affidavit from the Deputy Judge President Goliath making allegations and accusations against Judge Chope. So is this matter with the Constitutional Court Justices a precursor to what might happen with the matter with the Deputy Chief Justice? And I mean, um, the Deputy Judge President and who do we hold accountable for this? Who needs to act for this to come to finality? I'm Thank done. You. Thank you, Tabile. Uh, Justice Mosaneke, over to you. Let me unmute Ms. Konto. You true to form another difficult question. I think you and Ms. Draga decided you're going to be the difficult ones for the evening. Now, I'm far enough from the Western Cape to be safe, so you all better be careful. Uh, particularly Justice Saldana. But look, the point is this. I used the terrible occasion to show you that it was not all hunky-dory and fine. I show you that there was a honeymoon period 
the contestation began with the TEC case and the tension between the judiciary. When I was on the so that was not going to be a fun omen over time. So to Chief Justice, my justice law. And, and you know, cases come through to the courts. And it's feed to you and, and write it out and show you what it was all about. And in the he had to make so was this one on the warrants. I think the connection, um, the connection of the former Deputy Chief Justice has is connected. I, I propose that we give the uh, Deputy Chief Justice. Okay. I am back here, but something went wrong there, but I'm reconnected again. Welcome back. You, you may continue, please. But anyway, I chose not to go there at all because I'm a witness of potential. Make important points that you ask about. One, that judges are as accountable as any arm of state. You're right. But I was at the legislature quite was deemed not to have done his job with the cases that were brought to us. And we had to call on the legislature to do their job. With, on our desks. And we, the judges, had to tell our lawmakers, you have a duty to hold the executive to account. So you can't throw it at the judges, please. You are lawmakers and you must hold the executive hold the executive to account. So in, in, all in short, and I was making the second point that the system of keeping judges to account has, has been weakened. Not that one the judges have managed to run rings around the system for 10, 12 years. Justice Mutate, Judge Mutate is one such that comes to mind, for instance. So if you take point after point after point, and we know some people have made it an art, one person, you, can, you could drag the system out. And I'm saying judges don't do that. Don't be villains. You are the referees. You are the guys who are blowing the whistle. So you can't be the ones throwing the wrong punches in the field. So we have to cherish and respect our, our ethical uh, code. We have to be the ones who submit to our disciplinary processes. And promptly, we must acknowledge that dragging up is in itself a bane, a horrible thing. And lastly, that we have a higher duty because we are the ones who are blowing the whistle but the rest of the other arms of state. So it is a very unfortunate thing. I've raised it, I couldn't have left it out. And I was one of the, uh, I was one of the complainants. So is Justice uh, uh, Albisex and Justice Oregon, Justice Mokoro and a good few, all of us are still waiting up to this day. And I hope the judges would come off that for starters. And two, we need to amend the legislation, it's poorly drawn. I managed it at one stage. I've referred a number of judges to, to tribunals. I recommended that they be sent to tribunals, e.g. for failing to write judgments timelessly, and it got stuck at the JSC. And not even one judge has been properly found to have acted improperly in this jurisdiction, which is a shame. It's improper. Judges do err, they do breach codes, 
They should be held accountable like every other arm of the state because we need them. We need good referees who know the law, who, who, who are good at what they do and they remain honest and hardworking. So we can't allow the rot to set in within the judiciary. We should resist that. And that's what the book says and he tries to, to preach that, that line. Thank you very much, uh, former Deputy Chief Justice Mosaneke. I'm going to come to the chat uh, questions. I'm going to start with one uh, that says, uh, greetings TCJ, as a student representative, I would appreciate your insight on the evolution of student politics from your days to the current generation. UWC is rich history for being the institution of the intellectual lift during its heydays, given the type of students we produced. I would be fascinated to get your perspective on how the university has evolved and whether the phrase remains relevant today for our institution. If not, how has it evolved in your perspective and where should it be heading to? My it's goodness. Already. You told me that VC Pretorius is there. I had greeted him and paid my respect in his absence. Let you me did. just repeat again, VC. Um, thank you for having your university host me this way. I'm going to try and answer that question now in full and I'm going to be quite brief. I, I think, and you've seen in the book, my trust and hope lies with, with the youth. Right? I won't quote those favorite words by Fanon, which are quoted all the time. But every generation must, must fulfill its or betray its mission. We tried. We formed the Black Lives Association. We formed Nadell. We, we got off the blocks. People came off universities and June 76 and whatever else, basically to formulate what they think society should look like. When the youth stop doing that, we are in trouble. Not to be confused with violent conduct. I'm talking about active intellectual interrogation of those things that will change society and that change universities. That obligation sits on every generation. It sat with the Nelson Mandela generation with the youth league in the 1940s. It it sat with the UDF in the 1980s. It sat with the union formations in the 1980s. Every generation must formulate what works for it. Hence my prayer that they will know when things are wrong and they would not sit back and tolerate that. And that all would want to rise and say, this is wrong. And, and there's no violent connotation there. It is an emphatic requirement. So yes, you students have to raise difficult questions like I did had to fill today with your professors. You have to question the way universities are run, but truly, truly no violence. That is not my understanding. We have to find ways in which we can do that without. I said to some students at not so long ago, well, some of the gains we had, some of the things you win in a war are universities. Those are the spoils of our long struggle, and they are within our ambit and control. So it's silly to bend them down. They're the most tangible things that we want out of our struggle. We must strengthen them. We must have respectful interaction, but rigorous and very telling and very challenging, but always within the limits. Thank you very much, um, Justice Musaneke. I, I mean, you don't miss your you don't miss your words actually when you talk about the important role that the young generation should play. Uh, in in one occasion, I've heard you say that young people should replace those of us in the sunset, uh, and I think you, you you're re-emphasizing that point uh, even in this uh, conversation. I'm going to come to uh, another point. Uh, question. This is from uh, former Minister Trevor Manuel. It says a question distinctly for the next generation panelists. Justice Mosaneke deals very delicately with the matter surrounding a certain JP. The problem for the entire judiciary is that 12 and a half years later, the matter remains unresolved. Can the judiciary be united without dealing with this fracture? Now, it's carefully crafted question. It says distinctly for the next generation panelists, if Lisa or Tabile wants to come, the opportunity is, uh, is, is, is now. Uh, uh, otherwise, I'm, of course, uh, happy to give the floor back to uh, former Deputy Chief Justice or Judge Saldana to reflect uh, on this question. 
I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to relieve all of you of this difficult question and thank you, uh, former Minister Manuel, for being here and for raising the point. You see, our crisis is an institutional one in many ways, the crisis of our democratic project. We have whittled away institutions that we created and we bet it at di different times, different ways. I remember Edwin Cameron and I writing about, you know, in Glenister, how important it is to, to have corruption busting entities in their place and working. And other people have done that point at different times. In fact, you remember that I invite your former colleague, just uh, Minister Khadebe, and say he might be tempted to write an account of his 10 years as a minister, uh, minister of justice. So we have denuded a lot of institutions. And my point in the book, as you have seen, and I repeat again, and the reason why I give an account of, of the Chopper matter is really that we cannot again afford to destroy one of the most robust institutions that we built from the times of Arthur and Richard Goldstone and Tolima Madala and Pius Langa to our time to now. In fact, the high court judges have been catching most of the hell, even after that, who have been great, actually. So I'm deeply concerned about the, the care we must take not to destroy and allow the judiciary to be, and to be less effective than what it is. And, 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 and therefore, leaving unresolved conflicts and leaving judges all over the show over matters which are not principled is going to be difficult, I agree with you. But we have to work harder and harder, and the book is about that in part. And those of us who have retired probably should be saying more and more and saying, Parliament must go and revisit the law. We must tighten up you know, the, the disciplinary procedures against judges and reduce dilatory opportunities so that we should have the institution going. If it gets to the level of NPA as it was earlier, then we're in deep trouble, aren't we? We need, we need good judges, we need good referees if we want to play proper rugby. But if you come from Pretoria and the Blue Bulls like supporter like me, you need proper referees who can keep the game going. So that, that's my hope and trust and, and advocacy at this stage. Thank you very much. Um, Lisa, did you want to add? Add in. Um, so uh, Tabili and I teach constitutional law together. And one of the topics that we teach uh, is the judiciary and um, we use the affidavit, the recent affidavit, or fairly recent affidavit, against Judge Lope regarding the shenanigans in the Western Cape High Court as a, a question posed to our students in order for them to um, assess compliance with the Constitution. And nevertheless, it's a textbook case of constitutional provisions having been violated, and our students are horrified uh, when they are made privy to this material. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Lisa Tabile. If you wanted to come in, uh, otherwise I'm going to go to uh, and Judge Saldana as well. If you wanted to add, it's perfectly fine. Otherwise, I go to the next question. Once, twice. Okay, next question. But you can come later on if, if need be. Deputy Chief Justice Moseneke, former Deputy Chief Justice Moseneke, there is another question, uh, and it's it's. It's simple. It says a question from Chris, a question for Justice Mosaneke. What do you think is the most important factor to take into account when South Africa's next Chief Justice is appointed? I think we lost. We might have lost uh, the former Deputy Chief Justice, but I have no doubt that he will be back uh, shortly. Yes, I am here. Thank a bit of an unstable Wi-Fi connection here. If 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 it will help, uh, you can you can try to uh, to put the video off. Maybe it might help. Uh, 
Can you hear me? That will if you if you put yeah. the video off. But you fill me in. Is there a question I have to fill now? Yes. So the question is, uh, what do you think is the most important factor to take into account when South Africa's next Chief Justice is appointed? Oh yes, it's a difficult question. I know I can see that over uh, to try and make that very point. Um, and there's a debate that's going on that is quite helpful. And I think the debate should go on. Um, if we move away from personalities, and I think we should, in the first instance, um, a, a checklist of the kind of things that are important for the job. And I think some of some of but in a number of articles. Um, and we should continue to do that because we have, um, we, have, we have gone to a very difficult place in the past so that we don't lightly go back there. But some people make the point, and I think rightly so, that it's time for a, a woman chief justice. I'm coming now. Are we still here? Can I can I continue? Some yes, some continue. have made the point that you, it should be a man or another man, but that hardly is the yardstick. I think the qualities of a good chief justice are the same qualities, more or less, of a good judge. First, it must be somebody who observes the highest fidelity to the law, because it is about applying the law. Second, it must be somebody who would understand that the law has a primary end to it and in philosophical, intellectual end to it. So you hope for a philosophical, jurisprudential, intellectual leader. So not just knowing the law, but hoping to understand its workings in a way that will help. Three, it might be somebody committed for Delta the Constitution to our Constitution. That is our grund norm, if you want. That is, that, is, <clears throat> that is what we have for now until we depose it. I'm not calling it final constitution. I've heard the criticism around the word final. I'll just call it the constitution. For a, a judge and so to achieve justice must be a hard worker. It's hard work. And I hope the book brings that home. It's a hard grind. People like Judge Saldana work long hours. They read a lot. They don't have as much time as they would want to to look at the law all the time. They must write. And, and I describe to you the life of a high court judge in order to do that. I describe the life of a magistrate to show you how hard our magistrates work and what an important part of our justice system is. So the Chief Justice, you can't have a, an indolent Chief Justice, is what must be a hard worker, a grafter. Chief Justice must be a person who is able to convert all that intellectualism into writing, because it must be dispersed to the whole nation and the whole world. This may be the first quality for that matter. Chief Justice must be a downright honest human being. must certainly most of the time, if not all the time, at, at the height of her or his sincerity. You can't be a crook and at the same time produce just outcomes. So those are some of, those are some of the qualities. And I think I could, if I had more time, I'd write them down quite carefully. 
so that you can see exactly what's required. And the qualities are not very different from other leadership roles. They certainly are not that pretty much the same for a good leader. You could just add the law, fidelity to it, and a deep understanding of the democratic project under a constitutional state. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, thanks, Professor Mersman. Thank you, Deputy Chief Justice. Uh, I appreciate that. Time is not on our side. Uh, there was one, I mean, there, I'm, I'm glad that you came to the issue about the female Chief Justice. That was one question that was raised. Uh, there was one question that was raised by Mili. It was raised through email. Uh, I didn't get the full picture. It was about uh, Article 25 and land restitution. Uh, but I, I sometimes uh, ask for forgiveness than for permission. Uh, so I want to be forgiven by uh, Mili. Uh, that I'm not getting the opportunity to raise that question. There are a number of other questions, but if the deputy, the former deputy chief justice, uh, permits me at least one or two of those questions, uh, I would be very glad if I can uh, email uh, it to the former deputy chief justice. But what I'm going to do now, in the interest of time, is give very brief moments uh, first to Justice Saldana, and then to Lisa, and then Tabile to make very brief remarks, and then of course I'm going to give the opportunity to uh, our Deputy Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Vivian Lavac, uh, to make final remarks. And then, of course, I'll give the opportunity to the former Deputy Chief Justice uh, for his remarks, and then I'll close. Justice Saldana, over to you. Judge Saldana, you have the floor. Thank you, Professor Mesmore. And these are my uh, concluding thoughts. There was a question raised about the role of the university and students. And I think it's only appropriate for me to pay tribute to the many thousands of students in the fees must fall movement. I think it was an exceptionally important time in our country and we must never forget it. I, I sometimes look back and I thought when I was a student, maybe we could have done more. And had we done more, then hopefully things would have changed a lot more faster at the universities. But the fees must fall movement also raised important and very difficult questions for us around how do we decolonize education? How do we make it? People are comforted by just making guarantees. Like it's gonna be, it's gonna be painful. Can I also then deal with the second issue that I thought I wanted to deal with in concluding? There's the world before the pandemic of COVID, and there'll be a world after the pandemic of COVID. It has fundamentally changed the way we work, the way we think, the way we see government, and the way we participate as citizens in the country and the responsibilities for us. COVID has been an earth shattering. It has challenged us. It has challenged the constitution. The courts have made to rise to the occasion to make sense of the constitutional rights in the world where people's lives are at risk and good decisions need to be made. But it was also a challenge for the courts and how the courts had to rise to the issue of being able to be, provide technology for people, for court hearings to continue. It has also challenged the judiciary. And we hope that when the pandemic is gone, we will go back into the courts where we can deal with people physically and face to face. Because it does raise the important issue of access to justice and access for people coming to the courts and those people who aren't able to afford the technology to participate in these visual hearings. The last point I want to make, and that is to my mentor and to the judicial elder, uh, Justice Moseneki. And on my notes, all I have is three dots, dot, dot, dot. Is there a trilogy? And I pass, leave that to you. Two have been done, a trilogy is three and many more. Thank you very much, Chief Justice Moseneki for, for inspiring a whole generation of lawyers now and for the future. Um, it's a treasured moment that we've been able to spend with you for the past two hours. Uh, and I, and I suspect many of the others who have been part of this discussion have learned tremendously. And so we wish you good health and we wish that your pen may never dry. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Saldana. Uh, I give the floor to uh, Lisa.
I think that I'd just really like to take this opportunity uh, to say something that I would regret if I didn't say. Um, the book spoke a lot about uh, the law clerks at the Constitutional Court, the friendships that were forged, the marriages that stemmed from them. Um, it wasn't until I left the court and I started working as an attorney and I was faced with researching complex issues that I was amazed to discover how much I learned by virtue of being able to occupy that position as a law clerk at the Constitutional Court. And having a close friend who is a former clerk of Justice Musaneke, and as a clerk myself, I just would like to say to, uh, to Justice Musaneke that I am extremely grateful for uh, what he's been able to contribute so far as developing young legal minds at the Constitutional Court is concerned. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa. Much appreciated. Uh, Tabile? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Prof. Mesma. Um, this was very wonderful. And um, I, I thank you and I thank the university for the opportunity to engage with the DTJ and as, as well as to hear the views of um, Judge Saldana. And just from my side, um, my parting remarks are that uh, we hear your call, Justice. We hear your call to rise and we will rise in our respective spaces. I think um, that moment when you took up the silk at the high court uh, as a man, as a black man, um, was a very profound moment and um, certainly Lisa and I and many other young women of color in the academic space are rising in our own way to break down the barriers of transformation. And so we hear your call and we shall rise. Um, and just on a lighter note, because it seemed like I was coming with punches, I just want to know how you feel about the green robes after having worn them for 15 years because you disliked them at first. So. How do you feel about the Gucci gang robes, so the young people call them? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tabile, for those uh, uh, remarks. Now I have the uh, singular pleasure to give the opportunity to uh, our uh, DPC academic, uh, Professor Labak. Um, good evening, Professor Mesmer, the moderator, uh, former DCJ. Uh, um, Justice Mosineke, our esteemed um, participants here tonight. Um, I realize very fully that I'm standing between you and dinner, so I'll try and keep this very brief. What an engaging evening. I sat here listening to a true intergenerational conversation of issues of importance of our judiciary, social justice in our country and the state of our democratic project. ECJ, with your judicial memoir, you really sought to give insights into the state of our judiciary, our democracy and social justice and the state of our society from the lens of a former DCJ of the Constitutional Court. You mentioned what we at the university when we engage in quite fully and that explains why um, Lisa has probably also asked you those questions around decolonization, because if we are facing decolonization um, of legal education, then um, what uh, Judge, uh, Judge Saldana also mentioned, what about decolonization of, of our courts, our practices, our language, um, and many such things. So um, it really um, spoke to me when you were talking about the position of our common law that was not common to the oppressed people and, and how does one then deal with the values in our constitution, our constitutional principles, and, and stay true to the constitution? For me, this intergenerational conversation shed further light, as I said, on an evolving democratic project. And Judge uh, Saldana, when, when you mentioned, I had to smile, when you mentioned Harris 1, Harris 2, and Collins, I also come from that generation when those were the, con the constitutional court cases that we've done. But I think I'm one up on you because at least I learned about Codesa 1 and Codesa 2 in constitutional law. So, but what you really um, managed to do as a panel was what I appreciated, um, also Judge Saldana, 
is that you said that all rise, the book, sets out the ethical basis for judicial life. And that this, this is important not only to the judiciary, um, to remember that one should be behold, not be beholden to any political party and that one owes fidelity to the constitution, which is something that um, um, DCJ um, echoed um, quite a few times during the conversation. And what I also took from this conversation was the importance of ethics and accountability of a judge, but not only of a judge, but of a human being. And how this then becomes, and I quote, an important brick in the foundation for judges and lawyers and for citizens so that we do not make the same mistakes as in the past. I felt particularly proud of our two female colleagues that put you through your paces, DCJ, with the questions not only around um, multilingualism, legal education, decolonization, but also the contrast between our beautiful progressive um, constitution, the values that are embedded in our constitution and the love realities of our people. And I was struck by um, our former minister of finance's response in the chat box that one, in a sense, you also confirmed that later that one should not confuse what is what constitutionality um, uh, with a lack of accountability on this on the part of, of government or the executive. And you confirmed that, saying that we should be careful not to throw the the baby out with the bath uh, with the bath water. When I I'm very privileged tonight that I'm able to say a few um, words in thanking you for giving UWC the opportunity to launch, be part of the launch of your second book. Um, you uh, may recall, because we met long time ago to 2009, when I had a totally different role, um, that um, I, I had the privilege of doing the welcome at your first book, the, uh, My Liberator. And, um, and therefore, it's quite special to be able to, to um, fulfill this role tonight. Um, on behalf of UWC. What is evident for me listening to co this conversation is that more con such conversations are needed, whether on our constitutional values, on social justice, decolonization of the law itself, our courts, our court process, decolonization of legal education, issues of accountability, the disjuncture between rights and the lived realities of the people in our society. And now with COVID, the opportunities for digital transformation um, that also arose. Um, and I'm hoping that whilst one would want some face-to-face -face contact again, one would also leverage the opportunities that um, COVID has brought us. Thank you for allowing us the space to have um, this great engagement. On a lighter note, um, I saw that our, our registrar posted that now that you, it's possible to run as president as independent. Um, I think you must go to the chat, uh, DCJ, just to see. The question was whether you would consider running for president. And already you received quite a few votes in the chat box. I'm not sure if that is an indication of how successful you might be if you run for president. Um, in, I need my video to be on, DVC. I've been locked out, so you can see shaking my head very vehemently. <laughs> no, 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 okay. <laughs> but have a look at all the votes that you will get from the people from UWC at the very least. <laughs> I think one of the, the poignant moments for me was the fact that you spoke about judges being fallible, that judges are people just like all of us, and the necessity for humility that really um, shone through also in your responses to the questions um, that you received from our panelists tonight. And so in conclusion, I would like to mention the following. Advocate Anton Katz, SE, in his review of All Rise, ends his review with the following sentiments, and I quote, Justice Dihang Moseneke was, 
and is a brilliant jurist and human being. He has a rich eye for what makes a better society for all. And he has a great sense of occasion as his judicial memoirs so keenly demonstrates. The conclusion of Justice Edwin Cameron's foreword to All Rise is apt. He says the book is important and memorable. It soberly gives readers the incontestable facts and invites them to make their own assessments. We were privileged to have you and to have our panelists and with those few remarks to all um, the others that participants that were present tonight that may not have been mentioned by name besides our rector and some of our members of executive and all the other guests here on behalf of UWC, thank you and thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there you have it. Uh, only uh, the way our DVC academic uh, can, can put it. It was an excellent input and we really appreciate that. Uh, she is our DVC uh, who happens to be a lawyer and uh, of course as a faculty we're very excited uh, about that. Justice Mosaneke, the floor is yours. Again, so much deep. Um, yes. But and I need here. And people will tell you I I I asked for this quite early and Justice Mosaneke, you, you're breaking up. Um, but this great law school will continue. Yeah. Can you hear me? This great lady is so to the Mar Institute. And, and good night. Thank you. Can you hear me? Former Deputy Chief Justice Mosaneke, can you hear me? Okay, I think we might have lost him. I know he was saying good night, but I think it would be great uh, if we have him back uh, and maybe if he can. I, I, I think we've, we've lost him. Uh, if you can bear with me uh, for a minute, we're, we're winding down. Uh, he probably will, uh, will reconnect. Yes. Please, please go ahead. Yeah. Some, I'm done. And my connection is a bit unstable tonight. Maybe yeah. out of overuse, but I'm done. And thank you ever so much. Thank you. Okay. I, I was going to ask you if it was possible by any chance to repeat very briefly, but otherwise it's okay. I think the main message was, was a thank you. Is that okay? Yes, it is okay. And, and and value my connection with the law school in particular, uh, with which I'm sure our relationship will continue but over tonight to one of the you know to my two parts very productive tonight. You need Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and I've picked uh, quite a few of the points uh, um, that our relationship with the with, with, with the faculty will continue. So, so the, the final points uh, from my side, uh, the, the, just three points. One was that it was said that the book uh, should be read by every lawyer, judge, uh, uh, and so forth. And I think uh, I would even extend and say that it should be read by uh, our students, by our professors, and a whole range of other stakeholders. And one of the things that uh, the former Deputy Chief Justice Dan does with this book is actually demystifies 
uh, the process and a number of issues, and it's relatively fairly accessible from that point of view. I think it's absolutely important. Uh, there were a number of points that were mentioned, but uh, it's the way Professor Lavac has actually summarized the, the, the elements uh, was absolutely excellent, and I'm not going to try to add uh, anything there. Two final points. Uh, November 19, uh, we will have a memorial lecture for our former colleague, uh, Ivan Rujema, whose name was mentioned earlier. It just so happened that the speaker during that event uh, is, all, is someone from, uh, fro who worked with UWC, proudly UWC uh, at that, and is a former chief justice of Rwanda. Uh, and the, 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 the save the date has gone out, uh, the advert uh, with the title will go out soon. So we look forward to having uh, a number of you participating during that event on the 19th of November. My final point to the former Deputy Chief Justice. He says in his book about something that his mother often says, and I quote, the blessings of the Lord know no limits. And he uses this uh, to explain how he has never missed a day in court because of sick leave and he's been blessed with health and so forth. Indeed, the blessing of the Lord knows no limits because you have blessed us significantly with your service, significantly with your intellectual rigor, and significantly with the previous book, but now with this book. And we look forward to engaging with you. Uh, and as I often say, uh, you're not counting your days, you're making your days count. And thank you very much for being with us tonight. And we really appreciate uh, that you grace this occasion with your presence and with your input. Thank you very much, very much. Have a lovely evening. Uh, and uh, I apologize that we went a little bit beyond time, but I think it has been worth every single minute of it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you ever so much, and, uh, and good night. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy thank Chief you. Justice. Oh, yes, Prof. Oh. Uh, how lovely thank to you. see you. Um, I have been singing your praises as I'm required. You know, traditionally, if you go to any territory, you better <laughs> greet, greet the chief before you greet anybody else. Yeah. Otherwise, oh, the chief you. says you go out, then you have to go out. But thank you for this as always, uh, I much appreciate it. We are just glad that we could be part of your first book and now also part of your second book and hopefully part of all the other uh, very wonderful scripts that you are going to write for us. Um, <laughs> as I was listening to your um, uh, engagements, I went on to amazon.com uh, and downloaded the book immediately. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. I hope you find the time to read, Professor. <laughs> we are trapped at home, uh, so at night there is a little bit of time. <laughs> All right. It right. Hang, this is Albi. Yes, Albi. Hi, Albi. I'm listening, Albi. I'll be sex. Are you there? Yeah. I'm saying what a wonderful colleague you were, Adihang. And for everybody to know, so hardworking, so composed. Uh, you know, we're all highly strung on the Constitutional Court. You have to be. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tense uh, project that we're involved in. And you were always calm, you were composed, maybe inside yourself you felt highly strong, but you, you controlled it. Uh, and, and, and the contribution you made was just enormous. And it's wonderful to see how spry you are, uh, this intergenerational thing. The elders really, uh, you for long live the elders with you and Vincent, so good. <laughs> and also to see how cheeky the former law clerks are. <laughs> the cheeky in the best sense of the word, uh, confident and, and respectful in a nice way and challenging. So, so I just felt very, I'm, I'm glowing. I'm glowing as, as, as somebody very closely connected with UWC. Also, thank you to UWC for such a lively interaction. It's been a marvelous evening. I'll be thank you ever so much. I won't tell more stories about you then because you're so <laughs> kind tonight. Thank you, Albi. And I'm glad you agreed on Vox that you, you made a mistake in the Vox uh, decision. <laughs> yes, I did. I should have gone with you and Kate, but I didn't. And I thought I would confess to that. 
<laughs> yeah, confession <laughs> accepted. All right, thank you very much again. It's, again, it's been a lovely evening and uh, enjoy your uh, evenings further. But I, again, it will not be the last time that we're having this conversation. Uh, I look forward to engaging with uh, all of you, including uh, Jack yes. Sheldon. I'm thank. an extraordinary professor of that law school. So Absolutely. if you don't call me, it's all because of you. Thank you ever so much. <laughs> Believe me, you'll hear from us uh, shortly. Uh, it's not even going to take long. Uh, and I want to thank, of course, my dean, uh, our director at the Dela Omar Institute. I've also been informed that our deputy vice chancellor for research and innovation was part of the conversation. So uh, Professor uh, Jose Franz, I also want uh, to recognize that. But again, thank you very much. Have a lovely evening. Uh, and. Uh, and we look forward to engaging with you further. Thank you. And thank you, Professor DeVille. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much, uh, Judge. <laughs> thank you, Dehang, and good night. Thank yeah, you. Good night. I have, I've earned my supper. I'm gone now. Good night. <laughs>